Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, theorem, subfields, whatever you want to call them. Very, very biased collection. Very biased indeed. And today it's like super biased. Uh, but anyway, I would like to tell you about diagrammatic algebra. And um, I have something very different in mind than what you might know. So there is this old, if you are Bobakian, so you're kind of this idea of following uh, the Bobakian idea, the idea of following the Bobakian idea. So if you are like this Bobakian and there was um, a big, well, let's say trend against diagrams and mathematics. So the idea is um, essentially, well, originally people often argued like, oh, here's a curve of a function and you can clearly see it's continuous. So that implies it is continuous. And Bobakis would say, no, that doesn't work. So you should be more formally correct. Diagrammatic algebra is different. And I need to stress that. Diagrammatic algebra is not kind of an unrigorous way of doing mathematics. It's actually a really rigorous way of doing mathematics and easy to be computer verified, for example. Uh, it's like more the idea of replacing the usual classical symbolical logic by diagrams. So instead of writing a symbol, A implies B, you write a certain type of diagram. Why not? It's really just, just kind of the same type of idea. And a lot of diagrammatic algebra originates um, in some way or form in logic in the 19th century. So I should stress it here again. It's different from the idea uh, to say there's a function and then blah, 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 I draw a graph and then I get properties of, from that function just by looking at the graph. Diagrammatic algebra is really just replacing something you could write down formally in terms of symbols by diagrams. Why would you do that? Because that's kind of more, well, it's kind of works out nicer for the brain. Kind of diagrammatic algebra is kind of this idea of trying to get more intuition into it, kind of be more in favor of what the brain likes um, compared to kind of the classical mathematics, if you want, whatever classical mathematics is. So just to keep that in mind, diagrammatic algebra is absolutely rigorous. Uh, as I said, really rigorous in the sense that this is kind of easy to do, computer verified proofs. And let's be, let me be very realistic with you, I mean, very biased perspective. Um, so whether you draw a, a graph of a, of a function and then say it's continuous or whether you write down a proof and say that whether it's continuous doesn't really make any difference. The only proofs that count or will count eventually are computer verified proofs anyway. So. Um, Back to the topic of this video, diagrammatic algebra, and I'm trying to explain uh, the power of it, kind of why this works so well. Uh, in my favorite example, which is a bit trickier than you would expect it to be, it's not that bad, so stay with me, but um, kind of to need a little bit of structure to have enough diagrammatic operations, essentially. Because what I just said, uh, ignore the, the ramble, the waffle we had before, the interesting part of what I said was a diagrammatic algebra replaces symbolic manipulation with diagrams. But to get some interesting diagrammatics, you need to have some, at least some structure of symbolics going on, right? You need to have at least a little bit of structure. So you need to have a little bit, a little bit of structure to get going with nice diagrammatics. And that's what I will try to explain in this video. And at the very end, I give you some idea of the historical overview of how it works or how it goes. But this is like very biased, so we'll see, we'll see anyway. But let's get started. So it starts off very easy. Um, if you just think about the idea of swapping factors. So let's say you have some set, and in diagrammatic notation, I will just denote the set by a bullet. Yeah? So just the set is just a bullet. And maybe I should assume that a set is non empty, but let's, let's ignore that. There will be some set one, two, three, four, five, something like that. Okay. And I consider now many bullets next to one another. And this is like the, the product of the set, whatever, you know, like D of them, wonderful, something like this. And now I consider the swap map, which is really, it's exactly what it says. <laughs> it is this idea of uh, a map from two, two factors. Here's my bullet here, and here's my bullet here. Hopefully the notation bullet makes sense if you look at the picture. Uh, here's the bullet here, and here's the bullet here. And what does the swap map do? Well, in algebra, uh, in symbolic notation, it does this, but just swaps the two factors in diagrammatic notation. Um, I would just draw a diagram where you just swap the two factors. 
And how can you compose swap maps? Well, you have a diagram where some factors swap. So for example, this would swap the first two factors, but leave this third one in that, and leave the third one what it is, identity on the third one. And you have a map that kind of swaps the second two factors and you can just stack them together. And you get a map that uh, kind of does this, swaps the first two factors, swaps the second two factors, right? So you just stack those diagrams on top of one another. Okay, and that's, that's all you, I think this is actually already pretty convincing and pretty cool. Kind of instead of drawing, instead of always writing down compositions of maps and the swapping and whatever and the set, I just ignore the set altogether. I just write a bullet um, and I write the swap as a nice type of crossing and I get those string diagrams. People usually call them string diagrams. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it a little bit, then there will be relations on those diagrams. For example, if you do two swaps in a row, that is like doing nothing, right? You said x to y, y to x, to x to the first component to the second component, that's what I should say. Second component to the first component, then do it again, then you have done nothing. Eh? A little bit trickier, but also not so difficult is kind of this thing. Um, so if you kind of swap here first, then here, then here is the same as doing it the other way around. Turns out that these are all relations you need to describe the diagrammatic algebra, the diagrammatic category, whatever you want to call it, of the swap map. It's kind of interesting. So um, composition, as I said, is just stacking diagrams. Relations are those. And I have a diagrammatic calculus, which is absolutely rigorous. It just describes the diagrammatic algebra of the swap map. Okay, and the, the magic here is that my diagrams kind of got rid of all ne unnecessary nonsense, like what is the set I'm swapping or something like that, just replace it by a bullet. And we still have a kind of a very powerful calculus here um, of kind of pictures in the plane, and you can just draw them. So here's some form of a swap map, you just draw it, tip, and it doesn't matter how you draw it, because that's what the relation implies. It's kind of very nice. So it's kind of a very nice type of uh, swapping type calculus. And obviously people knew that for a long, long time. So these types of diagrams, I think appeared first with, um, with Gauss, potentially earlier. It's always very difficult to say, because um, if you just read old publications and you keep in mind how difficult typesetting was, let's say 100 years plus ago, you will not find many diagrams in publications. The typesetting is difficult. And if you just, well, I know that for myself. I have this idea of, oh, that's a beautiful picture I want to illustrate. And then I'm like, ah, it takes me two days to do it. Will I really do it? A bit questionable. And nowadays I'm, of course, very spoiled. So the type of pictures I could put in a paper, I just, or in a, in really in a publication, are just uh, way better than the pic type of pictures you could have done, put in a publication like a hundred years ago. So a lot of diagrammatics is actually lost because people never published it because it was like, physically impossible, let's just say that. But it looks like that this type of diagram calculus goes back to Gauss, where Gauss was thinking about an even more sophisticated one, and Gauss had the kind of the bright group in mind, if you know what a bright group is, coming from ideas of electromagnetism. Anyway, so a really classical picture, and I think beautiful and powerful, yeah? very, very good. Uh, and let's do something a little bit more sophisticated. A pairing. A pairing, well, I need a vector space now. That's why it gets a bit more sophisticated than just a set. But again, I do the same trick. I just say my vector space is called bullet. And I call the trivial vector space, my ground field. You know, I just call it one, and I will not draw it anymore. So here, I will draw it as an empty set. Well, I will not draw it because it's trivial. And I have those maps from two bullets to the ground field or from the ground field to two bullets. And let's say there's a pairing. So you have some form, you have some pairing form, you have some bilinear form, and you can just pair vectors. And you usually also have a co-pairing, which is kind of the diagram the other way around. And very similar as before, the diagrammatic algebra of co-pairing maps is just very satisfying so you can kind of build all these diagrams out of those maps. Here's one. You can build another one. Maybe it looks like this. And the way to multiply them is just to copy them. 
Uh, you take another one to copy it and you stack them on top of one another. Ah, they didn't quite work. I was too stupid to draw it. Anyway, you just stack them on top of one another and you get something that would do something like this, I guess. Here's a little circle component. And the relations that you realize are satisfied by um, those pairing maps, the bilinear forms, huh? pairings, inner products, something people have studied for centuries, maybe centuries is a bit over the top, for a long time, it's kind of nicely captured by um, one relation, which is this isotopy type of relation. You know? So you can just bend diagrams any way you want. So it's sometimes called snake, sometimes called zigzag or something. So whenever you have something, you can just straighten it out. And you get a completely topological calculus because you can just straighten out your diagrams and you can just draw them any way you want. And again, you have a very, very powerful method to, in this case, think about bilinear forms, you know, inner products, something like that. You get rid of all the complications. Everything that is supposed to be non-important is non-important. You don't have any vectors you need to consider. You don't have any vector spaces. You just have a plane and a very, very cute um, type of calculus. Dating this one back is a bit difficult. I don't know. Uh, this is around for a long, long time. Um, again, probably there's kind of the same type of problem. People don't publish, have not published pictures in their books, their publication, because it was just really difficult. Times change, by the way. But uh, like 100 years ago, that was like, uh, essentially out of question. Not quite, but essentially out of question. Okay, and now put both together and you get an extremely great calculus, which I call BR. Uh, we'll see in a second why I call it BR. Let's just call the calculus BR. The calculus of swap maps and pairing maps. So here are the additional relations you need. It's kind of really nice. Exactly everything that topologically makes sense. That's uh, what you would get here. So you just put them together and you get this beautiful diagrammatic calculus of swapping and pairing maps. And yeah, sure. It's a lot of fun to do that. Um, but if it wouldn't describe something important, probably it wouldn't have gotten important. So just again, here is the way to compose those things. If you have swap maps and pairing maps, you can just stack them nicely together. Really beautiful. And it, in this case, it's the first non-trivial example, as I said, it gets a bit more difficult now, but it, hopefully it's not too bad. So this BR, which is named after uh, one of the pioneers of representation theory, I just put a copy of copy a picture of uh, the corresponding paper here if you are just on the slide it's called richard brauer richard brauer richard brauer um one of the pioneers of representation theory and brauer described with this br um the br diagrams the orthogonal and symplectic invariants so from from invariant theory and um, the only reason why you need a little bit more sophisticated things here orthogonal groups so rotation groups or symplectic groups is the, the easiest kind of infinite matrix group you would write down. The general linear group doesn't have a natural pairing, so I can't draw cups and caps. Um, so that's why I go to orthogonal and symplectic, which is essentially just a, an even form and an odd form, if you want, on a vector space, because those come directly equipped with a, with a bilinear form, either even or odd, if you want. If you don't know what the black thing is, just forget it. Orthogonal is just rotations of, of the space. And you can write down invariance when it acts on its natural representation. And just This is just a diagrammatic calculus um, of those invariants. And diagrammatic algebra answers very similar questions. And note here, and this is maybe why I like this example so much, um, it, it's, not ter ter it's not terribly difficult to say what this is algebraically, but it's certainly much more difficult to just than just saying, oh, I draw my little diagrams and I stack them on top of one another. And that's kind of the power of diagrammatic algebra. And you don't lose any rigor, I say that again. Uh, it's still a completely rigorous, rigorous type, of, uh, type of calculus, but it kind of gets much easier to describe. Okay, to tell you a little bit about the history and where I think this is going, um, so, Questions of the form, who invented number theory? 
mm, a very difficult to answer. It has been around like for a long time and people did it without really inventing it and you, you know what it is. Who invented diagrammatic algebra is kind of the same. Uh, you will find a lot of diagrammatic methods already in, in Gauss's work. People write down diagrams to, to illustrate their ideas or something like this. Uh, or in invariant theory of the 19th century, people were very fond of writing down diagrams in various logical calculi. People were very fond of writing down diagrams and so on and so on. But maybe a little bit more important, it took quite a long time to, to fly. I can't really tell you why. There are certain trends in mathematics that certainly uh, plays a role. Then there is this issue that I mentioned that it's kind of really difficult to publish uh, nice diagrams, at least, let's say, even 20 years back from today, if you're watching it in 2024, it was not completely trivial to publish papers with diagrams. Um, but maybe when it comes, it comes really to life, are yeah, these modern examples, modern in quotation marks, modern compared to Gauss, maybe. So kind of modern examples are maybe the Penrose diagrams um, in the famous paper by Penrose on the applications of the negative dimensional tensors. It's a fantastic name, the negative dimensional tensors. Anyway, uh, Penrose was drawing this type of diagrams. You can really see beautiful example here in Penrose's paper. So that's a diagram thing. And the diagram thing, you could stack them and whatever. And on the, this is on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, there is some algebraic expression. That's exactly what diagram algebra does. Instead of writing down an algebraic expression, you write down a diagrammatic expression, and you kind of use your intuition to manipulate a diagrammatic expression. Another famous example, um, which came up in the 19, so this is like the 1970s, maybe, uh, Penrose diagrams, 1980s, uh, quantum topology, so link the famous Jones polynomial, the best not invariant ever, has a really nice diagrammatic description. Uh, you kind of hear from, from Lou Kaufman's paper, it's very, very famous. And then kind of get, got started from there on. And nowadays you find more and more of these because it's just somewhat how the brain is built. It kind of works a little bit nicer. Um, it's kind of easier to describe. If you really go back to this example, Writing down what orthogonal and symplectic invariance is. I didn't even bother to do it in this video. Writing down this diagram calculus is not so bad. And that's kind of the power of diagrammatic algebra. So usually you should think of you have something people like, whatever it is, and you try to find a diagrammatic description of it to kind of simplify working with it. And you would be surprised, if you have never seen that before, you would be surprised how easy it is to kind of now uh, proof theorems, even if you don't know much technology. So what is really excellent about diagrammatic algebra, and that's, that's my big selling point, is that you don't need to read 15 books on theory XYZ to even get started to do your own research. Usually you can get started right away. So it's a perfect topic to get to, into some uh, real research, which is like really important nowadays where, because we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, right, you pile up more and more knowledge to, to even get started to do something will take longer and longer. If you would compare um, when people 100 years ago got their PhD compared to when people get, get their PhD nowadays, there's some age gap between them. And it's not because people are getting stupider, actually people are getting smarter, uh, but it's really because it gets more and more difficult to kind of go to the point where you can actually start doing research. And in diagrammatic algebra, it kind of makes the climbing a bit easier because you kind of um, have replaced something that might be really complicated with something that is somewhat better for the brain. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.